All right, ladies and gentlemen, anyway. if I can get everyone to uh, please uh, take their seats, we'll commence in 30 seconds. Oh my God, there really is a gavel. Great. Uh, first of all, this is a public meeting to consider the uh, proposed comprehensive official plan and the zoning bylaw amendments listed in one and five of today's agenda. For the items mentioned, only those making an oral submission today or written submissions before the amendments are adopted may appeal the matter to the local tribunal board. In addition, the applicant may appeal the matter to the local tribunal, local planning application tribunal, if council does not adopt the amendments within 90 days of receipt of the application for the zoning and 120 days for the official plan amendment. Great, um, we'll start the meeting off. First of all, we do have regrets from Councillor Sorelli. Uh, Councillor Harder is running a little bit late, or I should say Chair Harder. Uh, at this point, we'll just go right into uh, the agenda. We do have five items on the agenda. But first of all, uh, we'll start with any declarations of interest. Seeing none, confirmation of the minutes. Uh, August 22nd, 2019, and minutes one of the sp Special Joint Committee on Planning Committee and Agricultural Rural Affairs, dated August 22nd, 2019. Are these received? Great, thank you. We do have five, five items on the agenda. The first one is the Citywide uh, Minor Zoning Study and Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Payday and Loan Establishments. We do have uh, some delegations. Uh, um, I'll ask if, uh, I, I, are these people in favor or not? Is Peter here? Peter here? Peter, great. Are you here to speak in favor and do you wish to speak today? Yes. Great. Uh, we, have, uh, we have Stephanie, Stephanie Graham, perfect, thank you. Uh, do you wish to speak today as well? Yes. Okay, wonderful. And Natalie Carrier, uh, do you wish to speak as well? Great, so we'll hold that item. Item number two is the annual development report. Is this item carried? Is it a small question? It's a quick technical question. Yep, please, go ahead. Very quick technical question for staff. Page 11, the um, rental vacancy rates for Vanier's are listed as data suppressed as it is not reliable. Just a very quick question, wondering what the reason for that is. Who's gonna take that? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, data from the rental market survey is provided by Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Uh, so we are simply rep reproducing the data that they provide in their annual rental market survey. Uh, there can be times where their rental universe doesn't meet or meet the required minimum uh, number of units in order to be statistically um, shareable. And in those cases, there is data suppression notes like this one. Okay, thank you. And a quick comment if I can. Um, I noticed the report mentions a. Uh, 22% increase in housing starts for neighboring municipalities. A lot of that coming from Lanark, and there's a, a, over a 200% increase in Carleton Place. I don't know if those numbers, how significant they are in our planning context in terms of some of our suburban growth, but it's something I would like to follow up separately outside of this meeting with staff and try to understand and get some analysis on what that impact may have in um, some of our outer communities and our growth. Okay, thank you. Noted. So uh, on item number two, is this carried? Great, thank you. Item number three, uh, design neighborhood collector streets. We have no speakers on this item. Is this item carried? Uh, uh, you know what, I if you do have questions, I'm gonna hold this item, we'll go back to item number three. Item number four, site, uh, site plan control bylaw. Is this, great, so I'll hold that as well. And item number five, we do have some speakers. Uh, three of them are actually, the three are in support. I'll ask, uh, 
Uh, Karen Daly, uh, you say you're in support. Do you see the need to speak today if we pass this item? Okay, uh, Aaron Coffin, uh, are you here? Do you feel a need to speak today if we pass this item? And Ann uh, Folick, Ann Folick, great. Do you feel a need to speak today if we pass this item? Great, so we have three support supporters on this item. Is item number five carried? Great, thank you very much for coming out today. Item number six, uh, appointment to the suburban panel of the Committee of Adjustment. Is this item carried? Great. So we'll go back to the first item that, uh, that was held. It's a citywide minor zoning study and zoning bylaw amendments, payday and loan establishments. I'll ask the first delegation to come forward. Peter. Mr. Chair, can I ask you a question? Um, is it staff's intention to provide any brief overview of, of the report? Or are you going straight to delegations? So uh, we do have a presentation if you do uh, wish to have that presentation. I do. Great. So at this point, we'll get to staff. If, if you can fire up the old movie projector there, we'll have a quick presentation. And Peter, you can hold your seat there. We'll get you to speak after the presentation is complete. Good morning. I'm working with two remotes, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, in, in 2018, um, the province created the Putting Consumers First Act, and within that act, uh, they amended the Municipal Act to grant additional authority to municipalities to, uh, in respect of licensing payday loans, and in particular to uh, be able to license the location and the number of these. In terms of council policy, there is a policy in the Human Services Plan um, that, essentially says, that essentially says that we identify um, the need to protect vulnerable populations from predatory practices. The Montreal Road Community Improvement Plan was adopted in May 2019, and, and in, in that document it specifically states that payday loan establishments will not be permitted a grant to locate on Montreal Road. And uh, in 2018, again, Council passed a motion requesting that planning staff do a zoning study on payday loans, particularly because under the Planning Act, we can regulate the location, a number of these um, in a zoning bylaw. And that within that motion, following the zoning study, uh, the Council will consider licensing. Currently, we have 54 payday loan establishments, which is down from 59 in 2016. The trend is very much downward, um, and the province has identified this. In 2013, we had 13, the, the province had 1,300 payday loans, and they're down to 760, so they are trending downward. The thing with payday loans is they popped up very quickly, and they popped up in clusters uh, around very specific streets specific arteries that go through neighborhoods zoned commercial. So we have many of them on Montreal Road in Ward 12, we have many on Bank Street in Ward 14, and we have other ones on Merivale and Saint, Saint Laurent, uh, and in three on St. Joseph in Orleans. We don't have any payday loans that have established in the rural area. In 2017, Council adopted a zoning amendment to add the, the land use term and a definition for a payday loan establishment. And at that time, they had to add that as a use in zones. And the way they went about doing it was to allow the payday loan establishment anywhere a bank is permitted. This was a temporary uh, consideration given that we knew that we were gonna undertake additional studies. Currently, payday loans are allowed in all of the commercial and mixed use zones. They're allowed in all of the industrial zones as well and they're also allowed in the major institutional zone. In addition, they're allowed in the R5, in the village mixed use, and in some of the rural uh, commercial subzones. When we took, when we did the study, we noticed two major land use issues associated with payday loans. The first is the proliferation and the clustering of these. 
And as a result of that, we've proposed uh, or recommending minimum separation distances, and there are three of them. The first being one kilometer between payday loan establishments. We already have that in the zoning bylaw for adult entertainment parlors. We're also proposing 500 meters from a casino or a racetrack, as well as 300 meters from any school or post-secondary instructional facilities. And the minimum separation of the schools is quite substantial. These, when they're combined, will result in the land use becoming dispersed and reduced overall over time. The second issue is its high visibility. When we look at them, when we see them, they have large signs in yellow and red. Some of them have, uh, um, what's the word? can't think of the word, sandwich boards outside, sometimes right on the sidewalk, with very interesting slogans, and they're all aimed at trying to get uh, the vulnerable po populations to go in and, and get a loan. They also tend to locate on corner lots, which gives them that much more window room to put their signs. And they locate along exterior walls in shopping malls and plazas, again, to continue the high visibility. So staff is recommending, in order to reduce the visibility, is two, two parts. One is to prohibit the land use in any bil building that contains a residential land use. And the other is that it must be in a building containing other commercial uses, so that it is no longer standalone. And if you look at the, the, the photograph, there is a standalone. And so that would no longer be permitted. And finally, when we looked at the zones, uh, we felt that in many of the zones, it, the use would be inappropriate as well as unnecessary. So we're looking at the R5 zone, shouldn't be allowing it. The local commercial zones are really intended to be for the everyday needs, for the very local population. So that's not quite what a payday loan is. Major institutional zone, that has museums, community centers, as well as the schools and uh, post-secondary. And we didn't think it was necessary that it be located there. Finally, it's, uh, or rather, the industrial zones, it's allowed in all of the industrial zones as a secondary use. But the city has lost a lot of industrially zoned lands over time, and there's no reason to put a payday loan in with the industrial zones. And finally, there are no payday loans that are located in the rural area, and we don't think it's necessary that they go there. They, they won't have enough of a catchment area in any case, so we're proposing to remove it from that zone as well. The issue with the payday loans is that they don't seem to need any development applications. They locate in existing buildings, and often they don't even need a building permit. So the problem would be that the city would never know when a new payday loan is coming in. And so as a result of that, staff, not at this meeting, at Emergency and Protective Services, they will be coming forward with a licensing report that will um, uh, support the zoning so that we know every year when they have to come in for the licensing we know where they are and as always mr. chairman when we introduce something new we always have grandfathering under the Planning Act that means that all the existing payday loan stores can stay as long as they continue that operation when they close down a new payday loan can cannot locate in that building However, a change in ownership does not result in the removal of the uh, legal nonconforming under the Planning Act. So it's the land use itself that's grandfathered, but not the payday lender. So they can sell their, their, their business to another payday lender, and that's okay. The vast majority of the payday loans will not meet the new zoning regulations. So over time, these w will be substantially reduced, but there will be some because the vulnerable, vulnerable population, as well as others, do need to rely on payday loans from time to time, and it's better that we know where they are than th them having to go online. And that's the presentation. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Demaray, for that presentation today. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to go directly to delegations first, and then staff questions second. Uh, Peter, uh, you've been here before. In five minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Peter Kucherapa. I'm a 
director of the Vanny Community Association and a private lawyer. I'm speaking to you today in my position under the VCA, the Vanny Community Association, and only in that regard. This presentation does not reflect the interest positions or policies of my employers, including those of the Government of Canada, especially during the election period. <clears throat> I want to make sure we're clear on that. I'm here as a private citizen in my own personal regard. <clears throat> as John Oliver provides in this week tonight, payday loans are not the best solution for community development. Over the past two years, the Vanier community has been providing evidence and advocacy that the proliferation of payday loan lenders hold an adverse effect on the economic and social development of higher risk communities. Many Canadian studies have demonstrated that the proliferation of payday loan companies and check cas cashing operations negatively affect the quality of life, hampers economic development, and facilitates criminal behavior related to drugs and crime. I will go into these very quickly. Quality of life. Independent academic research evidence demonstrates that payday loan operations results in a higher levels of mental illness, lowered life expectancy of constituents who live near payday loan companies. Economic development. A proliferation of payday loan centers limits economic development. When an operation can charge over 550% interest rates, it means that there's an investment of taxpayer dollars being invested not into community health and welfare, but diverted into ongoing debt payments, well beyond the criminal interest rate of 60%. <clears throat> and also in crime and development, it is difficult to have a uh, safe and productive community when there is sufficient evidence to demonstrate that payday loans could be used as an opportunity to launder drug money in the community. Lastly, in economic development, Communities like Vanier require diversity of shops and activities to balance economic retail. When one in three retailers on one street is a payday loan operator, it fails to attain the objectives of economic diversity for local economic development. In 2016, I authored a study that was undertaken by myself and stakeholders of the Vanier community, including ACORN, that provided three points. One, Vanier holds a disproportionate amount of payday loan companies exceeding the Ontario city and national averages on a per capita basis. At the time, there were 33 payday loan companies within a five kilometer radius of Vanier Montreal intersection. This was a demonstration of a proliferation of one type of retailer in a challenged community. Vanier has almost 20 times the payday loan centers than national city averages, and th sorry, 30 times more than the national average. The concentration also of payday loan companies is not evenly allocated across Ottawa. There is a correlation between locations of payday loan companies and frequent transit retail and low-income neighborhoods. This means payday loan companies are systematically targeting low-income persons in Ottawa, as per the report findings. When this report came out, the Ottawa Citizen published an article providing that Vanny had the highest concentration of payday loan centers in Canada. It is increasingly difficult for at-risk communities like Vanier to effectively transition to a more productive, economically sound and safer community when there's a high level of concentration of payday loan companies which contributes to economic decline, crime and poverty. This is why stakeholders of the community have come together and asked the city for additional regulations restricting the proliferation of payday loan companies, especially in low-income areas. The proposed amendments today before you by the city officials attain in advance the Ottawa official city plan. They help advance safe and healthy communities, they help protection of economic well-being of citizens, and they provide the opportunity to have location of, and growth and development of retail operations. As such, the community of Vanny is pleased with the city's progress to address these issues, and this as support is extended to the uh, SOS Vanier community and the Vanier BIA. The City of Ottawa is acting in concert with other jurisdictions across Canada and the United States. 30 seconds. As over 100 other cities have pursued regulatory restrictions. Our only concern, if any, is the issue of grandfathering. I would ask the city to further investigate the issue of grandfathering so it's based upon people actually moving out and not merely the intention of the uh, leaseor on the intention of their operations. And I will leave there and ask if there's any questions on this issue. 
right down to the second. Thank you very much for that. Um, we do have some uh, questions for our delegation, so hold tight, uh, Councillor Lieber. Thanks, um, and I, I think you're preaching to the choir around this table. Um, there are no friends to payday loan establishments uh, here at City Hall, I don't think. The uh, only question I have for you is, well, sorry, I have two questions. One, um, I didn't quite catch the meaning of your last statement with respect to grandfathering. And the second question is, is there anything the city has not done within its power uh, that you would seek that we would do? So, <clears throat> let me answer the second question first. The, within your power is, as a lawyer, I'm gonna say the city's doing everything it can do within the law, so thank you for that. Now back to the first question. <clears throat> Grandfathering, at this point in time, and I'm going to, again, uh, confer to my colleagues here to my right for further legal expertise on this, but basically it's fo focused solely on the intent of the vendor, and when they abandon use, it's not based upon the action of grandfathering. So when you, abandon the, when you physically abandon use, the, the property can still be used as a payday loan company in the future as so long as the property owner demonstrates the intent that it could be used as a payday loan. So for example, they say, our current tenant has moved out, but please come and use this as a payday loan company uh, facility. And then another payday loan company goes, you know what, that's a great location. It was already used as that. I want to now move in and continue using it as that. So that's the intention, right? The vendor says, please come and reuse it. The challenge is, is that once it's abandoned, the community looks at it and says, well, it's abandoned now. Shouldn't grandfathering kick in? Shouldn't that use be over? I mean, it was physically abandoned. The action was abandoned. So why was another one moving in? So this question of intention is difficult to assess. It's really about when the, when the, when the person who owns the building intends for another intend, uh, payday loan company to move in, it's justified under law saying the intention was clear. But the action demonstrated a clear abandonment. And for the community, that action of abandonment, you would think under actus reus under law, would be sufficient, if I can speculate, for the intention to be clear that it's now, the use is now expired and something else should move in, and in accordance with the city rules. Thanks, I'll, uh, I'm gonna ask legal uh, when the appropriate time is to, uh, to comment on that. I don't understand why at five o'clock on the last day of operations when they lock the door, that doesn't indicate that the use is no longer continuing and thus uh, obviate the, the grandfathering. So we'll, I'll get more information. Thank you, Thank that's you. all we ask is further investigation. Thank yeah, you. Wonderful, do we have any uh, further questions for the delegation? Seeing none, thank you Peter for coming out today. Our next delegate is uh, Stephanie Graham, Stephanie? Oh, as well as Giselle Bouvier as well, okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Giselle Bouvier and I am the chair of the Vanier chapter of ACORN. With me is Stephanie Graham, and she is the co-chair of the Vanny ACORN chapter. For those that don't know us, ACORN is a national independent nonprofit grassroots organization made up of low and moderate income families fighting for social and economic justice. We don't rely on government and corporate funding as we are primarily financed through membership dues. Our organizers knock on doors four hours a day, five days a week in low-income neighborhoods to recruit members and to find out communities' main concerns. We have over 28,000 members in Ottawa. <coughs> Excuse me. Anti-predatory lending, which targets payday lenders and fringe financial campaign. At French financial institutions has been one of our provincial and federal campaigns since 2004, and one of our mu municipal campaigns in Ottawa since 2015. We were happy when the City Council unanimously directed staff to look at controlling payday lenders back in April of 2018, as many of our 
members are payday loan users. We are pleased with the recommendation in this report to distance and license payday lenders. This is something ACORN members have been calling for to stop the proliferation and clustering of payday lenders in the neighborhood that we live in. That, that being said, we regret that uh, installment loans were not included in this study. Installment loans are short-term loans between $1,500 and $10,000 that are not subject to the Payday Loan Act. This means they can charge up to the criminal code's interest rate of 60%. Many payday lenders, such as Money Mart, are offering installment loans, and we worry about how this form of predatory lending will expand without proper regulations like the ones we're seeing recommended here today. Planning staff's recommendations are good steps towards fair banking. Go going forward, we would like to see the city create concrete initiatives to promote lower cost financial service, including delivery and promotion of financial empowerment supports and development of inclusive alternate financial products. We'd also like to see other levels of government to take note of Ottawa's positive step forward. We encourage you as city councillors when you're meeting with authorities from provincial and federal levels to address the issue of legal non-confirming status, which will allow existing payday lenders to be grandfathered. Uh, ACORN is also working toward lowering interest rates, expanding payday loan repayments, and forcing the ban on rollover loans with a real-time national database, supporting alternatives to fringe lenders, lowering NSF fees, and mandating the banks to offer better financial services for low-income households in cases of emergencies. With banks closing branches in poorer neighborhoods, reserves, and rural municipalities, the Postal Workers Union has asked municipalities to endorse their call for postal banking, which would serve as an alternative to payday loans. Hundreds have already signed up. The City of Ottawa, to our knowledge, has not yet signed, and we ask that you follow up the concrete step that we hope you take today with further action by supporting postal banking. We strongly encourage you to support staff's recommendation for minimum distancing licensing of payday lenders. We also ask that you take further steps that ACORN has suggested for addressing the urgent problem of predatory lending. And we also reiterate the fact that postal banking would be a bonus in rural areas where many of the prominent banks are closing now and seniors have no resources to get to the banks. Thank you thank for listening to us. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie and Giselle. Any questions for our delegation today? Seeing none, thank you for coming out today. Our final delegation, uh, we got to Natalie Carrier. Great, if I could just get that other microphone switched off and this one turned on. That's great, thank that you very right much. Man. Oh, sorry, I sat here. Uh, good day, councillors, city staff, and obviously our neighbours. I thank you for this opportunity to speak today to the committee on behalf of the Vanier BIA, uh, the 500 businesses we represent on the matter concerning payday loans. Anyone who has driven on Saint Laurent or Montreal Road will notice the high volume of payday loan merchants on our streets. In fact, there are 33 in a five kilometer radius in Vanier. That's more than 20 times the provincial and national averages. Beyond the obvious nefarious effects of these types of businesses have on the social fabric of a community, which I won't go into today, but I think most people around this table know where I stand, um, I would like to speak today strictly on the economic impacts of such things. In 2017, our Ottawa Vanier MPP, Natalie DeRosier, led the task, the provincial task force on the payday loan lender laws um, with our full support. 
As you know, traditional main streets are the heart of a community. They are designed to feed and serve and clothe and entertain the vibrant people that live around it. A thriving main street has a diverse mix of business servicing this area. The diversity ensures that restaurants are full and that people can access services, that people have places to shop on their lunches, and that the walkability is safe and vibrant, making it a desired area to work and live in. When one type of business dominates a main street, especially when that business preys on the most vulnerable people in the city, as is the case on Montreal Road with payday loans, it cripples the economic growth within that area. It deters businesses, new businesses, and damages thriving businesses. It taints the reputation of the area, and these types of businesses attract a disproportionate amount of crime and social issues. Furthermore, ludicrously high interest rates rob our businesses, our business community of valuable dollars that should be going into grocery stores and restaurants and local services. When someone is paying a 500% interest rate, they tend to not have any money left at the end of the um, week or month to buy things. Therefore, the Vanier BIA strongly supports the city's bylaw amendments today. Specifically, we support the zoning distances from each other and from schools. Um, and we hope that you will continue to moderate and regulate the zoning of these types of businesses over time and perhaps uh, in the future consider remo removing some of the grandfathered clauses in communities where the density of these businesses is so high. We feel this bylaw will allow main streets like Montreal Road to see business diversity, diversity proliferate and for our community to continue the important healing process that we are in. Thank you, councillors, for your time. Thanks, Chair. I'm breathing heavy, sorry. <laughs> Leave it there. Um, great to see you this morning, uh, Natalie. I'm actually gonna ask you the same two questions. Uh, ha is the city doing everything that it can within its power uh, to, to try to remove the scourge of these buildings or businesses? And uh, secondly, uh, on the grandfathering issue, um, what is your understanding of, of how that should be proceeding? Mm. Um, so on the first question, I'm not a legal expert, and I do believe that the city, the city always has the right intentions and does often put the, the, best, uh, the best case scenario forward. And I do believe that currently, within the laws and the regulations that you have, we are doing what we can. We as a BIA um, are also doing what we can as your, um, as your partners. Um, when it comes to grandfathering, I can only use the current example that we've just seen with pot stores. And we had a disproportionate amount of marijuana, illegal marijuana dispensaries on our streets. And when the law came through that said these places are no longer um, available and they're no longer legal, all of them shut down. And we now have barbers and a little African uh, cultural store. And we have tons of little stores that are popping up. A, a new little designer has moved in. And what we're seeing is this growth where, you know, where these empty spaces um, were left and where these people were paying very high rents, you know, because they could afford to because they were doing a legal business and not paying taxes um, or membership fees to the BIA, which was <laughs> our biggest issue. Um, I think what we saw when that hole was created was these beautiful flowers start to pop up and we're starting to see that and we live that right now on Montreal Road. So, uh, you know, the idea that Money Mart could decide that they have enough stores in Ottawa and they want to keep the one in Orleans and the one in Bell's Corners and the one in the market open, but they might close the one on Montreal Road and that, uh, you know, somebody else, Western Union, then moves in with the same business is terrifying because it, it essentially means that for streets like Montreal Road, it, it will have no impact because they become essentially license holders of these new regulated business. So if I wanted to open a strip club and I can only open a strip club where there are currently strip clubs, well, that's only there's only three places in the city of Ottawa where I can, I think, I don't know, I don't actually go to strip clubs, I'm assuming. <laughs> Please forgive me on that one. But, but I would only be able to go to one of those three things. So if my buddy who owns a strip club was closing down, I could buy his license. And I think that's what's gonna end up happening on Montreal Road. And so I really strongly enforce or encourage this council to look at what that means, not in Orleans where I live, um, you know, where there is one, but in on Montreal World, Road where I work and own property, where there are 33 
Like, that's too many. And these are the most vulnerable people in our city, and these people prey on them. They are on every block. So on my way to the drugstore to get the medicine for my kid, I walk past six of these, you know, that are all saying, if you're really broke right now, I can lend you money. You're gonna be great. And that's dangerous. That's really dangerous, economically and socially. So that's my answer. Fantastic. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Vice Chair Tierney, for filling in until I got here. Councillor Brockington. He always is. Councillor Brockington. Oh, are you? Yeah. Well, do we? I don't think we have any more speakers. Okay. And Councillor Blair. All right. So Brockington first. Anybody else? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just could staff first um, clarify whether we have the legal right to um, not permit these establishments from operating to begin with? In answer to that question, when um, the, the province amended the Municipal Act and amended the City of Toronto Act, they specifically included a clause that says that no municipality can ban them. Okay. Okay, so that I won't ask some follow-up questions then. Um, other questions relating to the distance, minimum distance um, that you have, one kilometer from other existing uh, establishments, 500 meters from a casino or racetrack, 300 from schools. Can you tell me why the latter two have different distances than the one kilometer for the other existing establishments? The first minimum distance is, is the, gonna be the largest one. That's typically how we do that in zoning. If we don't like the clustering of a specific use, we try to separate it as much as possible. The other uh, minimum separation distances are based on other factors. It's not appropriate to, in our recommendation is, it's not appropriate for university students, for example, to have a payday loan right in, right on campus or across the street, they're already having trouble financially. That's an example. In terms of schools, we considered the fact that many of these similar types of land uses that are deemed to be offensive um, or predatory, that we try to separate those as well from schools in the same way that we would separate the adult entertainment parlor. I'm trying to get as why is it only 300 meters? Why not one kilometer? You've already established one kilometer from other establishments yeah. because you want to avoid clustering. If you know that there are some strong reasons why having them close to schools uh, substantiates a distance, why 300? Why not be consistent and have everything at least one kilometer from another establishment, a school, or a casino? I think that if we did that, and put a kilometer from every single school in the city, we would basically be banning the use. There wouldn't be any area where they, they would really be able to locate. And, and it's not because of clustering in that case. It's about making sure that there is some distance so that, particularly on paydays where they have to line up, typically they end up lining up. So to separate that from the children. The children don't need to know that there's such a thing as a payday loan, for example. That's a little bit different than the goal of trying to remove the clustering that's occurred. I, I struggle in trying to understand what value these establishments provide the people of Ottawa. Obviously, some people who use the services are unable to acquire the services anywhere else, that this is their last resort, but the um, interest rates and other financial constraints that are like a uh, chain, you know, a ball chain to them that carries on forever, or not forever, but for a considerable amount of time as they try and pay off their principal and interest rate is quite frankly uh, highly unacceptable. And so even with distance criteria, the problem for many will remain. They'll just have to travel a bit further to get these services and the same financial challenges that they're experiencing now will continue. So I appreciate where we're going with this, but at the end of the day, those, those hardships that many of our residents face by using these services will continue. 
And so I don't mind putting stricter distance criteria in place if it weeds out more of them. I think that's a good thing. It's unfortunate we don't have the authority to decide whether or not we want these in our communities to begin with, but certainly this is a step in the right direction. So all this to say, I mean, I'm in favor and of even more strict distance criteria. I'm not gonna propose any changes today. I wanna reflect on that further because I wanted to listen to your rationale. And we've certainly had people who have been engaged in this process for quite some time speaking in support of the recommendations with perhaps some other to reflect on. But, um, you know, I wouldn't be sad if, if payday loans were wiped off the face of the earth. Um, I would just have to wrap my head around how the services that people rely on now would continue because I don't want to hurt them in that manner, mm -hmm. but I think they're being abused um, by, by the... Um, framework of, of these payday loan establishments. Great, thank you. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Councillor Blay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. What, what is the connection um, between uh, casinos and racetracks and, and payday loans? Why is there a specific reference to that use relative to this? The City of Toronto did the same thing. And so when we were doing the study, we thought it's, it, it's not a bad idea. And people that are at the casino and racetrack might be losing money. They, if there's a payday loan right there, it's very easy to go and get more money. So if that, they have to go off the site and go somewhere else, then maybe they won't be, be quite as tempted. Sure, it's protecting vulnerable people. Yep. Okay, so why is the same, uh, why is not the same prohibition or restriction in place for uh, in your recommendation for uh, lottery license holders, uh, bingo parlors, uh, beer and liquor stores, et cetera. Um, Madam Chair, part of the challenge that we have with respect to that is that we always have to regulate these distances on the basis of what is already in the zoning bylaw and what uses are clearly already identified. So a lottery establishment or a liquor provider or any of those, those are retail stores, anyone can do that. A tobacco establishment can locate at any other retail store. So there's no way for us to actually articulate that and screen that. And there wouldn't be a way for, uh, for us to map that out and actually regulate that in, in due course. We do, we do that though with things like group homes. Group homes can only locate within 300 meters, I think, of each other, and they can locate in any residential zone. There's no specific zoning for them. So pr theoretically, we have some capability of doing that for group homes. Why can't we do it within the commercial class? Well, a group home is a, uh, is a use that is identified under the, um, under the Municipal Act, so we actually do have the ability to, but within to identify the, that. Within the same thing as a, it doesn't have its own use. It's allowed within any residential zone, mm -hmm. right? So clearly, residential zone one on street one in Orleans is the same as residential uh, R1 on some other street in Orleans, and if they're too close together, uh, we presumably have some mechanism to understand that. Why can't we do that between commercial zone one in Orleans on this block and commercial zone one in Orleans on this other block? Do you know what I mean? If, um, I don't want to use any company names, but if, if company one has a strip mall that has a, a liquor store and a beer pad in it, and that's typically how they work in the suburbs at the very least, why can't we know that and simply say that because of that, there's a proximity limitation on the use of payday loans. So I think the challenge again is the, uh, the issue with group homes is group homes are in fact an identified use within the zoning bylaw. Uh, there is a, um, the previously there were registration effects that would occur and group homes still do come in when they come in for a building permit and uh, they have the opportunity to identify themselves on a voluntary basis. With respect to, uh, again, with a liquor store or a beer store or any of those things, those are not identified uses under the zoning bylaw. They are simply retail stores. Okay. Staff would need to actually go through and do an inventory. Great. So why can't we simply create a new zone or a new land use designation for the sale of alcohol, uh, amend the zoning bylaw to allow all, whatever is currently allowed to sell alcohol, have that by default, and then create a separation distance for uses related to alcohol. Interesting proposal, I'd have to, have to think about that, Councillor. Okay, um, uh, to legal, uh, sorry, one last question. You had answered uh, that in the change to the, I'm not sure it was the Municipal Act or the Auto Act, uh, it does not allow us to prohibit. 
was it, it does not allow us pro to prohibit payday loans or prohibit any legal use? The, the amendment to the Municipal Act, and, and it was the City of Toronto Act as well, uh, there's a specific clause that says that in no, no way may a municipality, sorry, municipality ban the use outright. So we have to allow it. But specifically to payday loans or any use? Specifically to payday loans. Okay. So to legal, um, how would we, if, if, if we today said we don't care about the grandfathering problem, um, as, as reflected by uh, the, the first presenter and, and the president of the BIA, that if once they move out, we don't want the landowner to retain that right, we want that right to be with the, the business runner. If we wanted to ignore that uh, and take that risk, how would we amend the report to, to do that? Madam Chair, if I could ask for just clarification on that question. So we as, as I understand what's being proposed is that if Payday Loan 1 moves out of my building that I own, as long as I, in my looking for rent from someone else, say that I'm open to having another Payday Loan establishment as well as whatever else, I don't care, I just want the money for the rent, I'm maintaining my intent per the first presentation and therefore the right to have a Payday Loan establishment is continued on my property basically in perpetuity as long as I'm advertising that I'm willing to take it. If we want to say to hell with that, if you leave, if Payday Loan Company A leaves, you can't bring in Payday Loan Company B, how would we amend the report to reflect that? I understand we're going to get taken to court. I'm wondering how we would amend the report. Uh, Ma Madam Chair, I, I do have to um advise uh, the committee that under the Planning Act, uh, legal non-conforming status is something that is confirm, uh, con conferred on these types of uses. Uh, there could be a legal challenge to such action. If you wish to amend the report, uh, I would need to discuss that with planning staff as it is their report, um, if that's the direction that the committee is moving. Okay, thank you very much. You are welcome. Uh, Councillor Dudas and then Councillor Leeper. Anybody else? Uh, great. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering in respect to the grandfathering and, and adding to what Councillor Blay had suggested, what are other uh, jurisdictions across the province doing in terms of that? Um, are they taking any different actions than what you're proposing today? I'm not aware that any municipality is trying to uh, fight the grandfathering clause under the Planning Act. I am aware because we did contact the province and we specifically said, is there any way that when um, a payday lender wants to close his business, is there any way to um, prohibit another payday business from coming in? And they said, no, the grandfathering is for the land use itself. It's not for who runs or owns that business. So, but, but just to bring you back to what's going on at the provincial level, we did have 1,300 payday loans and now we have 760. They want to get out of this business because the federal government and the provincial government have uh, continuously put harsher and harsher regulations on them in terms of the interest rates and so on. So we see this really downward trend and many of them want to go online. And the problem is the province won't S the province has said it's hard for them to find them when they're online. They don't give an address. So that's a bit of an issue. So we don't want them all to go underground, that that could be much more difficult. You also mentioned too in your preamble that you know their marketing is pretty slick, right? We've got the bright colors, we've got the sandwich boards, we've got things like that. Um, they're located in spots where people who are, are more apt to use their services would be wandering past. I'm just wondering, is there anything in that respect that the city can be doing in terms of bylaws? Um, you know, certain communities have restrictions on signage in certain, you know, in certain locations. Is there any way we can beef it up so if we can, if we're stuck with some of these um, grandfathering issues because of provincial legislation, is there any way we can be uh, bringing down the hammer harder in respect to marketing their ability to reach out to these vulnerable communities? The city does have the signs bylaw. I'm not an expert on the signs bylaw, so I can't speak to that. I can tell you that I looked into the sandwich boards, thinking perhaps we could get rid of those, 
Um, and because they're temporary signs, they are allowed on private property. So they're not allowed on the sidewalk. So if they push them up against the building, that is allowed. Beyond that, I can't, I can't advise any more on the signs by law. And just for my clarification, businesses that are offering multiple services, so payday loans in addition to say a pawn shop, so they're doing both, are we looking at those as well? Is it just their, that one aspect of their business or are you looking at all the aspects of it if they were to um, adhere to this legislation? We didn't look at the other ones. We know that those can, can be consider, considered quite uh, predatory as well. However, we were doing this and council directed staff to undertake the zoning amendment based on what the province had just done with the putting consumers uh, first. So we had to stick to payday loan and we looked into the definition and we were told, no, you have to stick to payday loans in this respect from the province. Madam Chair, if I can just add just one more thing. One of the things that we always have to do is we have to be very careful to uh, make sure that we can only regulate according to what powers the province has actually given us to regulate. Very specifically, the province gave municipalities the power to regulate payday loans, specifically through the Payday Loan Act. And so that is why we are able to go after that uh, through our, um, our colleagues with municipal licensing who will be bringing a report to, uh, to their committee uh, very shortly, but also why we, uh, we were able to look at this as a very specific land use under the Planning Act and through the powers of the zoning bylaw. Uh, pawn shops are considered to be just a retail establishment. They're not distinguished under provincial law in a manner that allows us to go after them in the same way that payday loans are. And so we always have to look to the Municipal Act to provide us guidance as to where we can provide that separation and what gives us the legal authority uh, to be able to craft regulations pertaining to land use on a very specific use. So in the respect of that, this is why this study is focused on payday loans. Uh, payday loans are something that is regulated by the province in terms of their operation, their financial mechanism, et cetera. As Beth noted, there's also fe federal regulations as well too. In terms of the ability for a municipality to affect them, that is directly guided by the language that is inserted in the Municipal Act, which again allows for payday loans specifically to be, uh, to be regulated by the, by the city. Yep. Thank you. Councillor uh, Vice Chair Tierney. Great, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one of the uh, the biggest uh, supporters of seeing changes uh, to Money Marts in general, and I'd be one of those supporters too, but I think the biggest on our council is Councillor Fleury, and I thought he'd be here cheering on this report today, so I just wanna ensure, did you speak with Councillor Fleury? What were some of his comments in regards to this report? We did have a meeting with Councillor Fleury and we took him through the recommendations and he, he, uh, he agrees with the recommendations. Okay, great, thank you. Do you have anything in writing from him at all? I mean, the reason that we're going through this process in no small way is he definitely has the most concentration, I believe, uh, of anyone in the city and uh, we've given it this much attention because of his interest and I mean it's how many times have we had it brought up at council even over the years quite a few times I think anyway I just he's aware he has he has said that he agrees with it okay thank you uh, Councillor Lee for questions I think um, one of the most damaging places that payday loans can locate is on traditional main streets this is a nice long laundry list of places where we're not going to allow uh, payday loans, which is fantastic and we have my full support on that. Could we ban them from TM as well? That's a great question and I thought about that at the beginning, but when you lay out the, the zoning map, you see that the AM zone, the arterial main street zone, is in the suburbs. And in the downtown area, there is virtually no AM. And so it's mostly traditional Main Street. So if we were to, and you do have the opportunity to, the opportunity to choose to uh, not allow them in the TM, but in so doing, you're removing them from the entirety of, of uh, the inner urban area. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a bad thing. Would there be a legal challenge to that? That I can't answer. Uh, Madam Chair, the Municipal Act does say that a municipality can define an area in which a payday loan establishment may or may not operate as well as limit them, so that would be something uh, that is 
possible for, for council to do is to not have them in a certain area. I think that's a discussion worth having before council. Okay. Maybe we can get some more legal on it as well. Yeah. And I, also, I think, you know, I, I mean, we have a, a large number of people that don't support having payday loan places, which is why we have this report before us and staff has spent as much time as they have on it. But, you know, I mean, obviously, there's probably a need to have some. Maybe, it, but, and, and, I'll, and I go back to before amalgamation when each of us, each of us being me and the and other, the other each of us, um, dealt with strip clubs. We had to have one strip club. We weren't, we were stuck with having one strip club in the Nepean, which, which we would have loved to have like killed it, uh, but and, it, and on its own it, it imploded and it closed down years ago. But we still had to allow that. So I'd like, good idea. So this is coming to council in a couple of weeks, so let's have a more, um, but let's get a bit more information. Yes. Uh, just, just a point of information, Madam Chair. Uh, one of the things that staff did do uh, while uh, preparing these regulations is they mapped out what the effect of those distance separations would be with respect to clustering. Uh, Beth has that map available that she can uh, she can pass around, and she certainly can sit down and show that to you. Uh, in effect, what that does in uh, cases, for example, Montreal Road, um, that would reduce the uh, the ability for payday loan stores to operate to really two along the entire length. So rather How than many, sorry? Two. You can only have two. Along the entirely, entire length of Montreal enough. Road, so yeah. it's quite significant. Uh, same thing when you look all along Wellington Road or another large concentration is actually in Bank Street on uh, Centertown. Uh, again, the, the benefit of the, uh, the TM zones is they are very intense pedestrian cores, absolutely. They are the heart of our neighborhoods, but they are also short. Uh, so when we, that was part of our thought when we imposed the one kilometer distance separation. It is a very lengthy uh, distance between payday loans and so it does significantly reduce the ability for these distances to agglomerate in those areas. Uh, if council so wishes, uh, that's certainly something that we could look into in terms of removing the TM zones entirely. But we would also uh, be more than happy, uh, Madam Chair, to pass around that map uh, to all interested councillors so that they can see what the impact of that distance separation would be on their wards. Thanks, uh, and uh, I will pop by colleagues' offices over the course of the next couple of weeks to uh, to have that discussion. Um, uh, well, it does raise an interesting point, and uh, Chair Harder uh, spoke to it. Uh, you know, we do hear the argument from time to time that payday loans are required to serve the unbanked, and the alternative uh, to that is um, efforts like what Causeway has done, working with uh, community health centers, for instance, uh, working with Alterna Bank to offer uh, micro-banking to the unbanked and services that are, are geared toward them. Um, and as we, it's not something that this committee can deal with, but as we continue to push these payday loans out of our city uh, and hopefully eventually entirely remove them, uh, I hope that the councillors around council table will support the efforts of uh, people who are trying to provide uh, real alternatives to that. And ACORN has been uh, an important partner in, uh, in doing that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Blay. Thank you. Um, it would be good, basically, the report articulates where they won't be allowed. I, I guess I'd like to understand then where they will be allowed. Um, in a separate memo is fine. You know, between now and council, that would be great. Um, also, one of the points on page 18 of the report, it says a payday loan establishment must be located in a building that contains other commercial uses. What is the policy rationale for that? Without that, they can, they can rent or buy uh, a building and be standalone, meaning it's all by itself. And yeah. that to me is, is, represents, again, high visibility. Um, so if they have to be located, for example, in a shopping plaza um, or in a building and they ha have them on Bank Street where it's not, not the only business in the building. And that way we can try to reduce the visibility a little bit. Isn't, 
Madam Chair, just to, just to elaborate a little bit more, this is a very similar to regulation as to what we've put in place for money exchange vendors. So in the, in previously you used to be able to go and you used to be able to do currency exchange in standalone locations and whatnot. Those are now required to be within uh, large retail establishments, shopping centers and things like that, which is where you find them. And so the purpose of that is to really significantly reduce the visibility. Uh, as an example, uh, there is a uh, payday loan provider on Montreal Road uh, down by Deacon Hill. Um, and they have occupied a former Pizza Hut location. And so it is a large, if you recall what Pizza Hut locations look like, they have wrapped that building entirely around uh, with um, neon signage, uh, bright red signage. So it, it is very significant in terms of the visibility and uh, certainly the accessibility to that location. So the intent to require these to um, be put into establishments with others is certainly to minimize that opportunity for the visibility and minimize the opportunity sure. for the signage to uh, to take more than one face of a building. Sure, I understand that, except for in a, in a suburban context, it basically means um, they're allowed because there are no independent commercial buildings in the suburbs. They're all connected as one building in a, in a mall type format. And so you're gonna be pushing them from main streets where many of the commercial buildings were individualized like a Pizza Hut or so on and so forth into the malls further into the neighborhoods. Do you understand, do you see what I mean? I do understand what you mean, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I think one of the things that, that with respect to uh, suburban uh, and subdivisions and commercial retail areas is that generally there is the, um, the, the commercial retail base on the main commercial plaza and then there will be the independent pads which will be located further out in the parking area. So without this regulation and without what, uh, what Beth has proposed here, one of those independent pads would be able to be taken up by a payday loan establishment which could locate very prominently right to the front of the arterial. Yes, they would still be permitted within suburban areas, but they would not be able to locate on one of those prime location pads at the front of the shopping complex. They would need to be back in yeah. with the remainder of the commercial retail units. Yeah. I just don't know, those, those, prime, those prime individualized pads have the highest rents, right? That's why it's always the beer store or the liquor store um, and not something smaller. Anyways, I, I'd like to understand where they're gonna be allowed because uh, there are vulnerable people in the suburban area that are vulnerable for different reasons, um, especially as our, as our communities uh, become more uh, 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 culturally and linguistically diverse. There are other vulnerabilities we need to consider as well. Thank you. Very good point, because you know we're very focused. The speakers that are out here today are speaking from a particular um, part of Ottawa, and certainly where we have the greatest majority of them. But you know, Councillor Blay raises a good point. Just because you know, for example, in Barhaven, if the average salary is the second highest household income, doesn't mean those people have money. They could be living in a house that's mortgage poor, hockey poor, soccer poor all of that kind of stuff as well, you know? And yes, they have choices, they could not have their kids do it, but still the pressure is there to have an out for your money, if you will, you know, or, and, and the need could be different. I don't know, this is like, uh, I think this is, I think that this conversation is going beyond and is more provocative than I expected it would be. So I think that's the purpose of why we're here. It's great. I think I'm going back to uh, Councillor Leeper. Anybody else want to be back on the list? Thanks. Uh, just following up from Councillor uh, Blaise's question with respect to casino racetrack, I think bingo is a specific defined use in the zoning bylaw. There's a there's. A I think so. I'd have to double check. <laughs> I think so. Okay. Uh, it, was there any thought given to proximity to? Uh, Honestly, to no. I didn't think about bingo hall. I, I, let's. I'm going to give. No, there's a point at which we're making a judgment, right? So, so I was trying to be reasonable in okay. terms of, yeah. Uh, again, something I might want to put a little bit of thought into over the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Chair. Reasonable and politics don't go hand in hand. It's very rare. Um, I don't even know what to Always do with this, this one me. anymore. You know, I mean, we, we, we have time, I think. I, I, this is what I'm going to suggest. I'm going to suggest that... Um, in the future when we have something that is so, um, it's got so many aspects to it, it's very much citywide, even if it's focused in a local community, that uh, staff provide the opportunity for 
uh, briefing where counselors can come, the media can come, they can come in and they can ask questions once the report's live. I think that that's important that we do that um, because I think a lot of the questions were really good and very different than, than I think what many of us expected. Uh, so we do have some time until uh, council. Um, if anybody has any questions other than the ones you, were raised, you have raised today, please share them. And uh, you know, the, the, what's the word? The, are we? We're not defined by a certain timeline here, right? I mean, we are. No. Uh, just a reminder, though, that the municipal licensing report is going to its committee on September nineteenth, and that they were both of both reports were going to rise to council on oh, September twenty fifth. Oh, protective services. Yes. Yes. Well, then we would just hold them both up. I think we, you know, I can tell you that if there's this many questions at this committee. Well, we don't have, as, as mentioned by Vice Chair Tierney, uh, Councillor Fleury isn't here. I think that maybe he would have had other questions to ask had he been here to be part of the conversation. He's just an example. I think that there's others. I mean, I mean Councillor Leeper, I, don't you agree? I mean, I, I'm thinking Councillor McKenna. I'm thinking a whole bunch of people just off the top. All right, so what are we being asked to do with this? Receive it or approve it? So are we going to approve the report going to, to council? We'll we approve it as it is and then go to council and then if we make changes we can make it there. What do you think? Yeah, yeah? okay, so it's carried? Yeah, it's carried? All right, good. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for having all the answers too. <laughs> and thank you for coming out. How many times have you been out to talk about payday over the years? <laughs> so there you go. Don't miss an opportunity, because there's probably more coming. Thank you. Okay, the next item that was held was designing neighborhood collector streets. I have a presentation uh, the staff have prepared if you would like to see that, or are there just questions? Just the questions, so we don't need to do the presentation. Welcome, Mr. Edwards. Okay, so who is on the list for asking questions? Okay, Councillor Gower. Councillor Hubley, go ahead. Well, I think it's a, a very quick question for me. Um, Councillors get a lot of inquiries from the public about speeds in our communities. And I've noticed in our community, a lot of the requests we get for traffic calming is on collector streets. Um, I think the report presented is excellent and uh, I'm glad to see it, uh, the recommendations. There's one of the cross sections that indicates specifically um, the aim to have a 30 kilometer per hour environment. And I was curious about, you know, with the other um, cross sections that are being recommended, what is the approach? Are these intended as 50 kilometers or 40 kilometers an hour? I'm just looking for some context behind um, how these streets have been designed and what the intention is for speed and safety in particular. Thank you, Chair and Committee. Um, in the design of uh, streets, it's important that we actually design the street for the intended speed, the speed that we wish to post. Uh, this, and the design provides cl clear cues to the uh, to the driver for the context and their behavior that which they should act. If uh, a street is posted at one speed and the design is for a, another maybe higher speed, then there's confusion to the driver and they're attracted actually and they have the capacity to drive faster than we intend. This document shows ways to integrate speed management right into the design as we implemented the first time. And it includes uh, clues and features such as bulb outs to define the parking, along the street. It brings the street trees into the street uh, edge more closely to define the street and provide that kind of vertical uh, resistance, if you will. And finally, we develop scenarios where we have parking alternating, uh, on-street parking up and down the street. These contribute to defining a more, uh, a tighter, closer street, which would then operate at the intended speed at which we wish to post. So these have been integrated into the uh, designs that we're illustrating, proposing in this document. These are not necessarily reflected in the existing designs that we have been building our collector streets in the past. So this is an update 
to reflect that process in that process. Okay, and then this, uh, the recommendations would apply to any new collector street in an existing neighborhood, as well as rebuilds or redesign of uh, existing ones, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, my question is to do with the cross section where we have um, a, a little boulevard, if you will, uh, between the uh, car traffic and the pedestrian and the cycle traffic. The, is there gonna be some separation between the pedestrian and the cyclists in that model? So there will be no separation. However, we are following uh, AODA uh, recommendations and that we will have a tactile delineator between the sidewalk and the cycle track. We did look at opportunities to separate the two. Uh, however, we ran into issues with uh, uh, maintenance, op maintenance and operations. So we did look at those alternatives, but from a, uh, an ongoing operations and maintenance perspective, we, we landed on this final iteration. So no effort to, or, or no way we can protect the pedestrians because we're hearing about a number of cyclists and pedestrian accidents, some of them leaving people permanently uh, injured. So in the case of uh, the typical speeds of, of cyclists and pedestrians, they are much uh, closer in nature. The, the important thing that we found in consultation with our stakeholders was to separate uh, pedestrians and cyclists from motor traffic. So a lot of our cross sections you'll see uh, in, in the pre-vetted cross sections, which we have nine of, many of those cross sections have boulevards of two to four and a half meters of width. And, and that was the main safety issue uh, that we were trying to address. And uh, so changing now to the boulevard itself, uh, I see you have the trees in the boulevard instead of on the other side of the pedestrian and cycling track. What's the life expectation of those trees when you've got salt from the road as well as the uh, uh, sidewalk all being dumped on where the trees are? Yeah, so in all of our cross sections where we have dedicated space for trees, there is a, a minimum two meter offset from the road. And based on the, the integrated speed management, we, we've determined with our operations group that uh, the, the salt spray uh, will, not be, uh, will not affect the, the placement of the trees. The issue is when we start placing the trees closer to the road, and then we have to come up with mitigation to, to deal with the salt spray. So in all of our pre-vetted cross sections where we have dedicated space for trees, there is sufficient uh, separation. Uh, in, in, this, in the situations where we identify potential space for trees, we've, we've identified that issue as, as requiring additional maintenance considerations. Because would that not, space not be for snow storage in the winter? Yeah, so the boulevards. of the year? Yeah, so the boulevards, uh, the wide boulevards are strategic. Um, Utility, meeting utility requirement, uh, clearance requirements was a, a challenge and we found with these wide boulevards we could meet uh, snow storage requirements, uh, utility clearances, tree offsets. So these wide boulevards, which we don't typically see today, are, are one of the, the key elements here and this is how we save space. Uh, so in this case, for again, for salt spray, uh, uh, snow storage, um, and utility clearances, the, the wide boulevards meet those objectives. And finally, uh, does this uh, design with the trees there, will that give us, I know under Building Better Suburbs that the, the chair and I worked on, one of the things we uh, worked on with staff and, and stakeholders was how to get some bigger trees into the neighborhood. So is this gonna allow us to have a bigger root ball uh, uh, type tree that'll uh, provide a nice canopy over the Sidewalk, is that the intention of uh, uh, however many meters you said that space was? Yeah, this is, this is exactly one of the main uh, drivers of the wide boulevard is that we can provide sufficient soil depth uh, and volume for a large tree canopy. So these are, are trees in the range of 15 meters at full growth. Um, and they're, they're insulated by that offset from the street as well. So one of the issues we had with uh, the previous cross section is we could only identify uh, the occasional space for small ornamental trees. The, the, there are a few cross sections in here where we have consistent space for large trees. 
Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll tell you that all those crab apples have re that were the only thing. It's some I've got some neighborhoods that have nothing, but even the crab apples become such a problem because they drop on the sidewalks, make it extremely dangerous for people to freaking walk on them. <laughs> on their way to the 27 schools in Barhaven, uh, Miss Chi, I think that this is like the last item that we had. I'm going to recommend that um, you provide an opportunity to further brief anybody on council before everybody, any of the councillors before council meeting, if you could arrange that. I think that would be helpful. Um, you know, we've got a lot of people here who weren't here for building better, smarter suburbs, and it was like a five year piece of work that was very, very fulsome. And so I noticed when I'm reading this, because of my familiarity with it, like Councillor Hubley said, I, I'm identifying, you know, reasons why you did some of this and you worked with the industry on this as well because obviously you have to have their buy-in on the new streets. So do you take that as direction? Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dudas? Um, you spoke, uh, I've, I've got a couple of quick questions. Um, you spoke about snow clearing and that that was factored into this consultation. Was, uh, I know that uh, in hearing about the need to snow clear for cycling infrastructure and sidewalks. Is that also taken into consideration in terms of if we build collectors with the segregated cycling? You're nodding your head. Okay, so I'm getting <laughs> that's yes. Yes, it yes it does. It has been incorporated. We worked with our operations staff to develop a scenario that was enable them to efficiently and uh, in a maximized way to address pavement clearances for sidewalks and cycle track. Okay. And my understanding, maybe this would have been answered through a briefing, but for clarification, um, a collector street, is the optimal collector street to have front facing residential on it, or is it to have it as a true collection of vehicles to move through to more uh, larger arterial roads? There's a diversity of collector streets in our neighborhoods. But the, the true intent of these collector streets is that the, you can have frontages of homes, schools, parks, sometimes shops along the street. So all the cross sections illustrate land uses that have direct access to the street. Okay. Do you find with our current city's collector streets that we have an I, I won't hold you to it if you don't have the answer, that we have a greater number of residents who have issue with traffic traffic uh, concerns on living on those streets as opposed to side streets. So I, if you live on Bearbrook, for yes. instance, and you've been living there and you know that you have it, are they, do we find that we have a higher number of residents who live on collector streets who have issues with traffic related concerns and speeding and then the city has to come in with temporary traffic calming measures or uh, area traffic management, so more money invested by our taxpayers to resolve a traffic issue. Councillor, uh, yes, we have observed that and it's uh, true and that's why these uh, design guidelines are set up so that any new or, a retro, um, or reconstruction of roads would follow this design. So we would then mitigate the, the current um, complaints of uh, traffic, speeding, and volumes, which were based on uh, guidelines and designs that uh, roads that were built decades ago. Yep. So this, this will address those issues. And I'm really happy to hear that, and I was happy to see this work done on that. So I would only encourage you to consider that as we implement these streets and we work in lockstep with the TMP, that we consider limiting maybe some of those front facing residential because the fewer people are living on these and the, the more roads we have that act as, act as real roads for cars and transit and cycling and getting to and from amenities and schools and workplaces in our community, um, the less we're going to have a, of those conflicts and the less impact on our tax dollars when we try to go resolve those issues. To me, it's smart planning. So. I'm really happy to see the work being done here and I look forward to us implementing it. Councillor Blay. Thank you. Um, in developing these, how was minimum lot depth taken into consideration? So <clears throat> in laying out a plan of subdivision, 
the, uh, the, these collector designs would be built into the overall structure of the uh, community. This would not impact the zoning or the uh, lot sizing, but would really... Uh, it, it, it has to by default. If you look at 26A, yep. you have the sidewalk and the uh, MUP um, on the close side, I'll call it, to the, to the house uh, with the tree in between. Yes. Uh, whereas if you look at 26B, you've got the tree on the close side of the house with the sidewalk and the mump on the far side. Even in your visual, you can see how the driveway distance is, is, is affected. Uh, one would allow for a small or family-sized car versus the other allowing for a truck or a minivan. Um, and it changes by definition your lot depth requirements or the type of vehicle you can own when you live there. And as someone who has bought several new homes, this is not the kind of question people buying a new home ask. And so you're gonna arrive at your brand new house and not be able to fit your car in your driveway, let alone the two you probably actually own. So yeah, we, we did consult with uh, representatives from the Greater Ottawa Home Builders Association. And, and certainly with, with the suite of cross sections we have, the amount of driveway overhang we provide private driveway overhang we provide within the right-of-way is typically less. Uh, so in those cases, so for the 26A as an example, we, we do have a minimal amount of driveway overhang, and so that would affect, uh, uh, like you said, driving uh, uh, driveway setbacks uh, or property setbacks. However, the front of the building can also be, uh, it doesn't affect the frontage of the building itself. It may just affect the garage. So. When it comes to uh, the designs of the properties, we were informed that yes, it would affect the, the position of the, um, the garage front with respect to the, the building front. Uh, but in other cases where uh, we have already approved uh, cross sections or, or uh, right of way widths, there are other options in the suite that are available. And you're, you're basically gonna leave it to the home builder at the time of after zoning, after registration, at master servicing to make that decision basically. So basically once there's no ability for political input at all, that's when the builder is going to get to decide. What? Well, if, if the decision on what road segment to use is done at the point of engineering, then your CDP is done, your subdivision plan is done, your zoning is done, <laughs> all of which need to be accounted for in these decisions. Yep. Otherwise, you're going to end up with problems. So, and I'll give you an example. Tenth Line Road. We widened Tenth Line Road south of uh, uh, Lake Ridge down to Harvest Valley about a year ago, two years ago. A MUP was added uh, to the west side of the road, and that, uh, which is perfectly fine. Um, it will get uh, used in the future. But that changed the streetlight configuration on Tenth Line to requiring protected uh, left turns in order to give the cyclists uh, on the single lane mop on one side of the road uh, the right of way, thus backing up traffic because there are actually no cyclists uh, as of yet. So how does this cross section change the need for protected versus permissive traffic lights inside the neighborhood? Uh, let me go back to your first key point. Um, it's important that this document uh, contributes information in the actual development of the community, for example, during community design plans. So when land use types are chosen and road types are chosen and the road uh, rights of way are identified at that time, it is there that we can coordinate and uh, the proper selection of not only the cross section or the right of way, but the type of cross section that would be appropriate and the land use so that they work together is identified. That's the first I step. And then the second step would be is after, uh, if we are looking at a, where there's been an approval uh, through a secondary plan and we're now moving into plan of subdivision, there is a range of alternatives within, an, uh, within the uh, typical standard rights of way of 26, 24, and 22 that a developer can choose amongst those or modify them to meet the needs of their adjacent land use. But I guess that's my point, right? It needs to be incorporated at the CDP point Otherwise, it won't work together. And given that we, we are five or six years removed from the last urban expansion, at least in Cumberland, all the CDPs for the urban expansion are done. 
I don't know what it's like in Barhaven and Stittsville, but the CDPs are done. And so now we're going to be modifying at the point of engineering stage after zoning the, with these new cross sections. You see what I mean? Yes. And it's not going to flow together. So how do we get it to flow together? I guess my point is the decision point on which cross section needs to be made earlier in the process. Councillor, yes, and if we encounter a situation where things don't align, um, these are guidelines. They're they're not um, they're not uh, policy, so that it must be done. So it would uh, decisions would be made in the context of what's out there. Um, we try to provide for some flexibility at the same time, trying to direct the designs towards something that is more community based for the collectors. Um, we will take this back and uh, think about it some more and uh, perhaps if we can meet with you, Councillor, to speak about that before Council. Yeah, I think that would be valuable. I recall we passed a rule, a bylaw, or perhaps it was a direction that in Stittsville, as an example, uh, every driveway had to fit two cars front to back. I think we passed this three or four years ago uh, because Councillor Codry was dealing with a problem. This cross-section would eliminate that ability, you can only fit one car, which may be a good thing to do. I'm not commenting on that one way or the other. I'm saying it puts that policy in conflict with this. Um, I think we just need to consider the neighborhood functionality, um, and especially when you have an area where there's an urban expansion, uh, but the communities are gonna link together with roads because the urban expansion has always been foreseen you're gonna have one cross section and then when you get to the neighborhood that's old but maybe still only six years old, it will stop and you'll be forced, you'll force the cyclist back into uh, a road type that's not designed this, do you know what I mean? Like there, there's no plan on how we're gonna link it together. Because I know in Cumberland, the urban expansions are gonna extend existing communities and we plan those existing communities assuming an urban expansion and so the collector roads all end in those little fire loops understanding that that road's gonna continue further south in the future. So the southerly portion will have this new standard and they'll arrive to the north and be forced back on, onto the road or something. Do you know what I mean? Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I have that happening right now and it's happened three, two years ago in Barhaven and Half Moon Bay. So we had the Green Bank realignment that was supposed to be starting to, I think, design and build around 2016, which was delayed. Now I had to take the money, as you know, from that to pay for Strandhurst. Now we have developers that are developing according to their 2006 CDP, 2006, that have had to pay $400,000 to the city in order they could get a plan of subdivision because there's gonna be a change possibly to the grade and that's just on the north side of Cambrian and now I'm up against it on the south side, which probably won't be built for like 15 years if I'm lucky. How old will I be? Very old. And I may not even be around. Yes, I will be, Doug James. My point <laughs> is, is that we have this colliding right now, okay? So, and it, it's when the engineering gets involved, that's the problem, for sure. So we need a further conversation on that. I don't know uh, how we, we do that and whether this locks us into the point where there isn't gonna be room for wiggle room. I don't think so. I think that's part of the problem. It doesn't lock you in nothing really locks you in and then you get into a situation and then you go, what? You are facing the same thing now. Okay, so is anybody else uh, wanting to speak to this item? So you have the direction that you're going to meet. All right, so let's see. So is the de designing the neighborhood collector streets uh, approved. I'm actually uncom. Un yeah, yeah. I think approved with more work, um, better understanding, ironing out the details, right? Okay. Thank you very much for coming out today. Uh, I think we only have one last one last item that is held for question, and it's the site plan control bylaw. And Lily, you're here. Technical amendment. I don't have who uh, wanted to speak to it. Councillor Leeper? Thanks, and uh, I saw this on the uh, the agenda of ERAC a while ago and sent it around to some of our community associations um, 
for their comment. Uh, we're having difficulty figuring out what this technical amendment would mean for the urban area. Uh, how is that GFA calculation being used? And then what is the implication for site plan uh, requirements or not in the really? mature neighborhoods? Sorry, really? I thought Leanne was gonna answer, yeah. okay. Sue? Yeah, um, Madam Chair and Councillor. So to understand the intent of the technical amendment, I have to bring you back to the February uh, amendment, which was a major one to the site plan control bylaw. Before the February amendment, uh, singles, semis, and uh, three unit townhouses, they don't ever need a site plan. So what the February amendment did was saying, if you're over 600 square meters, we want to see a site plan. If you're under, we'll let you go. So that's, so through that exercise, we're actually um, having more uh, rigid rules in terms of what site plans, or when the site plans will be required. The intention of that amendment has always been for the single semis and the townhouses is above the ground areas because typically below the ground areas are basements, uh, mechanical rooms, and you know the heaters. So they're not typically they're not uh, regarded as the uh, selling unit sizes. When we see in the market when you know the development industry is selling a townhouse of uh, two thousand square feet they meant above ground area. So, and during that time, we didn't discover the difference of the uh, intent of the bylaw, uh, the site plan control bylaw, and the definition under the zoning bylaw. So after uh, council passed the bylaw uh, in implementation, we discovered the difference is causing lots of problems to the industry. So if we don't correct it, then that is not the intent of the uh, original amendment. That's why this uh, technical amendment is necessary. Okay, where, uh, where do you find most of these issues for the development industry are taking place? I don't think anything has crossed my desk in, in Kitchissippi Ward. Right, so, it's, uh, so c typically would it be for a three unit townhouse. Uh, you know, if we want to let, if each of the units above ground are 200 square meters maximum, uh, we want to let them go without a site plan. But because we don't have that technical explanation, and always the, you know, in implementation, we would have to count everything underground as well, so that the mechanical rooms, basements. So basically, then none of the three unit townhouses can just go by without a site plan. And that's what the intent of the amendment. Do you risk missing secondary dwelling units that? really are, are second rental units these days? So secondary dwelling units has always been uh, allowed, uh, you know, pre the February amendment. So they, if they are the secondary truly by nature, they are allowed in the townhouse units. It's only becoming a problem when they're not a secondary unit by nature. Exactly. Then that is converting the unit to either a duplex or triplex or apartment building for which when we calculate the gross floor area, we do count the uh, ground area, on the ground area basements as well. Okay, perfect. I'm good, thank you. Anyone else? So on the uh, site plan control bylaw technical amendment, is that carried? Thank you. Okay, I think that's all of the held items, is it? Okay, so now we will go to um, any notices of motion, but we do have an inquiry. Councillor Blay. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, the province of Ontario has discussed the possibility of selling the LCBO and broadening the distribution and sale Someone of works. alcohol. Uh, further, as professional sports leagues are embracing organized sports betting, including in-game, uh, in-arena facility betting, can staff investigate the possibility of establishing specific uses related to these activities to maximize the city's regulatory control. Can you explain that a little bit, please? Uh, we were just told that we could not establish a separation distance between payday loans and uh, liquor stores and beer stores because they're not identified as specific uses. They're allowed in the general re uh, commercial zone. And so this would be to investigate establishing specific uses for the sale of alcohol uh, and for sports betting. Uh, because sports betting, the NBA as an example, wow. is just embracing sports betting. Um, and if we're actually going to 
protect vulnerable people, then we should maximize regulatory control. It's one thing when the LCBO is selling alcohol. If they open it up and let every Joe Schmo sell alcohol, it'll end up in every uh, corner store uh, we have. And if this is an inqu inquiry, so sure, but it's an inquiry. I I, I, and We're I only discussing it because you had a question. No, I absolutely support the um, uh, the intent of what Councillor Blay is doing, but uh, you know we have discussions around what is an inquiry or what is not. Is is really that a zoning study uh, that is being accomplished by means of a of an inquiry? No, I I, I guess I just want to understand what would be involved. Yeah. What, yeah. what do they have to do? How much work would it take? What hurdles there are? Yeah. I think the, the, the wording was unclear, but if that's the intent, fantastic. Thank it's you, Chair. It's not queue jumping. All, God knows all of us would like to jump the queue with something. All right. That's it. Any other business? Wasn't there something I was going to say in other business? Does anybody remember what it was? Do you remember? Okay, we're adjourned, and I'll see you back here on the 26th of September. I know, we should go to weekly. Weekly.